I'm so excited for this event because this is kind of, I think the first event for Sustainable Wenatchee where our focus tonight is on social justice and social sustainability as our primary focus. We've um, tried to have many events where we show kind of the overlap between environmental sustainability and social sustainability and how interlinked they are. But this is the first one where our, our main focus is really social sustainability um, and talking about how important that is. So thank you all for, for coming to this. Um, if you don't know much about Sustainable Wenatchee, we're a small nonprofit that works to uh, create a culture of environmental stewardship and social sustainability in Wenatchee Valley. And this event is also co-hosted, co-sponsored by Wenatchee Outdoors. So thank you so much to Sarah and the Wenatchee Outdoors crew for co-sponsoring with us tonight. Um, so uh, I, I told you all that we're recording. And then the other thing I wanted to let you know, um, just in case anyone's having kids join them or anything, is that I, I watched some of these films and there's a little bit of language in, in a second film. So just a little heads up there to be kind of prepared for that. Nothing terrible, but it, it pops up a couple times. Okay. Um, now I am going to go ahead and introduce our panelists. And um, we have a, a quick trailer that we're going to start with and then three short films. And so I'll have the panelists introduce themselves and then we'll watch the trailer and I'll let Chelsea talk a little bit about that. And then we'll watch each film, give the panelists an opportunity to kind of share their thoughts and um, their experiences. And if anyone has questions, feel free to post those in the chat. I think we'll probably hold off on um, participant questions and engagement until the end, but we'll definitely uh, try to make time to do that at the end. So we'll just allow our, our participants to mostly share after each film. Okay. All right, so we are gonna start with introductions tonight with Mary Big Bull Lewis. Hello, um, Tilus, Ishtikanshut, Oki Nidaniku. My name is Mary Big Bull Lewis. I introduce myself in my native languages, which are Inhumpchin and Pekani. Um, I'm a member of the Colville Confederated Tribe of the Wenatchee, Moses, and Inuit Bands, and a descendant of the Blackfoot Tribe. Um, I'm an indigenous entrepreneur and the co-owner of two small businesses, Our Digital Design, which is a graphic design business, and Wenatchee Wear which produces wearable art. So Wenatchee Wear is passionate about creating awareness and empowering indigenous peoples through authentic threads. Uh, I was honored when Jana asked me to acknowledge the land for tonight's event, which continues a discussion of diversifying outdoors. These are the homelands of my ancestors, the Pascuosa Wenatchee tribe, Nishqui Kuyasht people in the between. Acknowledging the land we live visit and recreate on is the minimum we can all do. Land recognition with purpose is allowing the original stewards of these lands to be recognized as people and our voices to be heard. It's important to learn and share the untold histories of indigenous peoples that have been omitted through our history books, which are primarily written through a white lens. Pascosa have called this valley home for hundreds of years, but unfortunately many tribal members no longer live here. The Pascosa are a non-federally recognized tribe that is under the governance of the Colville Confederated Tribe, along with 11 others. This is due to the 1855 and 1893 treaties not being upheld by our government. We lost our land, the fishing and hunting rights that were promised. It's also important to align yourself, organizations and businesses with indigenous led projects to continue forward progression we have to begin to heal in order to create positive change. And that's where I'll input our Wenatchee Land Back fundraiser, which is spearheaded by Wenatchee Wear and is focusing on reclaiming land, building a community center and a trading post for indigenous peoples. Uh, we have more information on our website. It's at wenatcheeware.com. We all must do better. I'm here representing indigenous solidarity and to continue to use my voice. Standing in solidarity with our BIPOC relatives, our histories of oppression have long been intertwined. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Lisa, you wanna go next? Yes. Hello, everyone. Good evening. 
Uh, my name is Elisa Lopez. I am a local here from Wenatchee. I was um, born and, and raised here and I'm, I'm still here. I'm still adventuring the Washington lands. Um, I wear three different hats. I am the project director for Team Naturaleza where we take people outdoors and we do bilingual environmental education so that the environment is uh, learned about by more people and not just people who speak English. I also am an educator at the Wenatchee River Institute. So those are my two part-time jobs. I was actually um, doing camps today with uh, students in K through two, I think, or K through three. And we did a litter pickup um, in Leavenworth. So we picked up maybe like 40 pounds of trash on the waterfront trail. So that was, that was my highlight today. Um, and I'm also on the board of Sustainable Wenatchee. So that's how I'm, I'm involved and yeah, thank you. Thanks, Elisa. Karen, you want to go next? Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, special shout out to my mom. Hi, mom. Can't wait to see you. <laughs> it's been too long. Um, we live, uh, my daughter and I, we live in Kashmir. Uh, she's a student at, uh, well, in the Cascade School District. I work in economic development, community development for the state. and. Uh, love, love, love this part of the world. Um, love getting outdoors as much as humanly possible. And am honored to be one of the board members for the Waste Loop, uh, one of the and Cascade Wellness Committee uh, with the Cascade School District, and uh, one of the founding board members for the, the new North Central Washington Equity Alliance that you can look forward to hearing more from soon. And, and it's also just been an incredible pleasure getting to know the women who are on this panel, uh, particularly over this last year, and especially working with, with Chelsea, well, actually, yeah, all three um, on the film that Chelsea's gonna talk about. So thank you. And this is, this is Slippy. <laughs> yeah, so I guess I can go next. Um, my name is Chelsea Murphy. Um, and at first, I just wanna say thank you to Elisa and the group that picked up garbage uh, in Leavenworth. I think that that's awesome. And I would totally join you if you let me know next time. That's cool. Um, so my name's Chelsea and um, I am currently just, I guess, wearing many hats, just like Elisa. Um, I am currently working on a, a project where we're uh, co-producing and co-directing um, just a film that is bringing representation to outdoor film and um, outdoor recreation. Um, I have a, an Instagram account, so using social media for justice and for good, um, bringing diversity to the outdoors and creating space for uh, black women and black kids, um, particularly black mothers, as I am one. Um, I know that representation matters so much. And so I speak to a lot of, um, just my situations growing up in, in a lot of white spaces, uh, white communities um, like Leavenworth. Um, and so, yeah, I just try and share my knowledge through my lived experiences and um, yeah, I guess speak up when I see things and hear things and, and try and help people do better um, in this community. So that is what I'm doing and I'm super excited to be here tonight with you guys. Um, I love Mary, Elisa, Karen, you guys are all doing really important things in our community. And so I'm really thankful that Sustainable Wenatchee and uh, Wenatchee Outdoors invited us here tonight. Um, and right now we are all uh, characters on this film project that we we're working on uh, featuring 12 by by walk, so black indigenous women of color. Um, we have, um, they're all actually Washington women, which is really cool, which is why I hope everyone will get really excited. Um, six local and then six from the other side of the mountains. Um, so our filmmaking crew is multicultural as well. We're a team of women co-collaborating and just really trying to influence um, uh, and harness a belonging for women of color in the outdoors. Um, this is not your average outdoor film. Um, as we would say, you know, we are trying to recreate what it looks like to get outdoors. So for those of you who love to go birding or nature walking or spend time in the garden or if you forage with your family, um, fishing, hunting, all of these things are so much um, uh, Kind of things that have been forgotten as as important or count towards your outdoor recreation and so we're just trying to recreate what it looks like um, 
for all people to be included in in the outdoors and representation. So um, yeah, we're just we're inspiring land stewardship, which is so important. Um, and just you know whose whose ancestors were on this land and really bringing in wrapping all of that into our, our filmmaking process. Um, we have snowboarders and snowshoers and we have um, people just, again, walking out in nature and enjoying what that looks like, um, being very casual. Um, and so it's, it's just a really important film, I think. I don't know if any of you have been to a film festival, but um, when you go there, there's not much representation out there. And so we are really trying to just change the way that people are creating films for one. Um, and also changing the way that we view outdoor films and see uh, representation on screen so that you know my kids, Karen's kids, Mary's kids can see themselves in the outdoors and really just strive to, to uh, have a relationship with nature and want to do better for our planet. That's really our hopes for that. So um, we're gonna show the trailer. I think Jana's gonna get that going for us here. And so, yeah, thank you guys for, for listening and we're grateful to have you all here. Thank you. Yes, let me get this lined up here and we'll hopefully not have any technical difficulties. Some people do. Let's see how I'll share my screen. Here we go. And looks like everyone's muted. So I appreciate that because we definitely want to be able to hear without any kind of weird echoing going on. So I will get this going. Um, and give me thumbs up to let me know you can hear it. Cool. No? Okay. Maybe it's because of my, let's take me off Bluetooth. What are you, trying to make sense of our hues? As our chocolate brown fingers braid raven black hair in salute to the spirits of our grandmothers. They ask, why are you here? As we step into the radiance of the woods, the waterfalls, waves, and peace. In play, in pilgrimage, over challenge we thrive. Our healing men's roots of the earth. Beyond their expectations, beyond their line of sight. Onward to our own horizons. It's here, in nature, we claim our belonging. I'm the only one that you'll be like, you're clapping. That's the bad part about Zoom. Everyone's clapping, right? Thank you for sharing that, Chelsea. That's amazing. Um, I think we'll just move into the first film unless any of our panelists have anything specific they want to talk about the trailer. I just want to add that watching it on Zoom does not do it justice. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a quiet room, you know, go in there and get your headphones and go check out our website, uh, bravespaceproject.org and rewatch that because it's so moving when you can hear the music. Um, there's a, a woman named Nikki and her husband over on the west side that actually uh, made that for us. So that is, it's super special. So I hope you guys take some time to go watch that. Um, 
yeah, because it doesn't always come across as best on Zoom. <laughs> That's all, but thank you. <laughs> okay, got a message that the, the uh, sound didn't come across well. So I'll try to turn up my volume. I turned it down a little bit because I didn't want it to like sound too bad, but hopefully the next one will come across a little bit. But you can share your sound, but you have to click that option. It seems like you didn't share the sound from the computer. Okay. <laughs> this is real life right here. Um, okay, so how do I share my sound? Does anyone have a quick answer to that? Uh, Jana, when you go to your share screen, you should be able to see a little a box there that says share sound. Okay. Um, do you see it? Yes. Lower left, that's how you do it. Okay, got it. All right, well, I apologize, Chelsea and crew, that the sound wasn't great for that, but we will send out the, um, the link for that and so people can rewatch. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen for the second film. So this one is called Color Outside. And get it going. And then give me, thank you, Joan, for that tip. And give me a thumbs up if it sounds better. Me and a friend had hiked up to the top of a mountain. We were like super excited to have done it and we we're, you know, feeling really good about ourselves. And we met an elderly gentleman up at the top. He was kind of like, hey, like, are you visiting? And I was like, no, we live here. Oh, are you students? And I was like, no, we like, so we were going through this kind of 20 questions. It was just really clear that he was kind of trying to place us. Essentially, he was like, what are you like two black girls doing up here? There were so many other like kind of small experiences like that, just being out and about here. There's just different ideas of things that black people don't do. And, you know, the list is long. It's almost like anything fun and that's like bringing you joy and that's like allowing you to experience the world turns into like a white person thing, which is, you know, I reject that. My name's Nyla Blades Wiley, and I am the marketing strategist. Do you want raspberries or do you want cherries? So I have two kids. I have a daughter uh, named Zoe. She's four and a half. Hi, and I have a little guy named Jackson, and he is a little over one. What is happening? Wow. So I grew up in Montreal, Canada. We were a family that tried things. We went camping or we had gone skiing, but we just weren't like a camping family. Hi, this is Nyla. So we moved to Salt Lake City three years ago. It was a huge move. I was a new mom. We didn't know anyone. Doing a featured item of the day in each. And then also I had a marketing agency so dealing with clients and dealing with employees and all of this stuff. And I did feel like I was definitely at that brink of burnout. Yeah, yeah when, when were you thinking mom. of um, going, doing that? You, like, but, you know, I didn't want to kind of, I guess, go inward. I still did want to make sure that I was exploring our new home as much as I can so that I could give it a fair shot. I wanted to make sure that I was getting out there and meeting new people and especially exploring the outdoors. Coming here, one of the first things I did was I looked at Meetup and I looked up groups of women. So, you know, you would look at a women's group and it would still be like these badass women. Women that are like rock climbing or they're Iron Man participants or, or whatever it is. And it was really intimidating. It felt like, okay, do I really belong out there? Am I gonna embarrass myself? 
are people going to be like, okay, you're taking way too long. I just felt like there was a huge barrier to entry and so much to learn. And that was a big part of the reason why I started Color Outside. <laughs> All right, well, welcome. I'm so happy you guys were able to come out. If you need to stop, let us know. If you need a drink of water, totally fine. But we're just going to get up there and um, have fun with it. <laughs> Do not clap. <laughs> It's all about helping women of color get outdoors. And it's really about having a more joyful, adventurous, carefree life through outdoor adventure. So the community of women that are in Color Outside are phenomenal. Like they're so excited and they're super giving and kind of just like ready to jump into things. It's just been really amazing growing this community and then also seeing kind of the ripple effects of that. I think as women, and especially as women of color, we're taught to shrink. You know, we're taught to be small, we're taught to be quiet, we're taught to not be too loud, or too brash, or too rude, or all of those things. So I think that it's really powerful to take up space, and I think that it's so powerful to take up space in a place that is not traditionally for you. Awesome. That's a cute one. Yes. Our skin looks good. I know, glowing. <laughs> I don't see a lot of people like me when I hike. I feel like people just walk around and they look at me and they're like, they take a double take. Like, it's great to be with other black women and share other experiences with each other. You know, no one can really pat you on the back like your black sister can. To know that even though we don't typically see this maybe in marketing or maybe on TV, we do do this. And I think sometimes it's good to change the narrative, even within our community. Well, black people don't do that sort of thing, and, and that's just not true. To be able to just really stand boldly in that and be like, here we are, we're taking up this space and we're kind of taking back this space. I think that that's something that's really powerful. Jackson, can you touch your head? Where's your head? <gasps> There's your head. What about tongue? Jackson, where's your tongue? Uh... <laughs> I think that my kids are like really at the heart of like, you know, everything that I do. Um, they definitely are a big part of my why. We tried, I tried, I tried to get at you, but I didn't know why I couldn't get up. When I just look at them, I'm like, I, I want them to exist in a world that feels reflective. I don't want them to have to look to create community because they feel excluded. I don't want them to look at certain sports or certain activities or anything and say like, oh, that must not be for me because I don't see anyone that looks like me represented. Reach for the stars. like There's that saying where it's like, you can't be what you don't see. And I think that to a certain extent, that's true. That's part of what you'd learn in astronaut school. You want to go to astronaut school? Yeah. Representation matters. You have to see yourself represented um, in different aspects. <laughs> it's so important for little kids, but it's important for like big kids too. It's important for all of us to kind of just see other people doing things and be like, oh cool, like maybe I could do that too. I feel like the outdoor industry, like they definitely market to the badass. But I mean, we're all badass, right? Like, you know, just living life and thriving, making changes in their community. Sometimes it's badass to just be able to kind of quietly go through life and like provide for your family. And if that's what you're doing, then you're a badass. Okay, that was color outside. So I'm gonna start off, I've seen that, uh, Elisa, are you on? Looks like she's been having trouble. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so I'm gonna ask our panelists just to kind of get the question, kind of the, the discussion going, and then we'll just kind of let 
the the conversation naturally go. But the first question I had to kind of kick this off was um, wondering if any of you have had a similar experience to what Nyla describes at the beginning of this film of the older gentleman trying to kind of place her, kind of questioning her being outside and the activity she was doing. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, not necessarily uh, just in the outdoors, but just in our community in general. Um, with, you know, going to a public, a bank, actually, it was microaggressions and, you know, I didn't fit the stereotypical Native American, like, you know, as she assumed that I would look like uh, when I, when she saw my last name. Um, so it's those little microaggressions trying to educate um, and just still feel represented. But um, I am grateful for my relationship uh, with my, my husband and his love for the outdoors too. Um, so when we go out hiking, um, I'm really into hiking and we do a lot of different things that I feel comfortable out there and represented, um, not necessarily you know, I'm, I'm here for a reason and to be there and to represent Native Americans, so. Years ago, I had a, a crazy experience. <laughs> um, I've, I feel like there's a, a before and a, like a parent period and then like my now period. And in my before, my before child period, I was in many ways a lot more uh, adventurous in terms of how I engage with the outdoors. So in 2004, I want to say, um, after I passed some graduate exams, I went camping in the Virgin Islands by myself. And I set up at my campground and I'm nice and comfy. And um, another camper comes by and assumes that I'm a drug dealer. And assumes that that's why I'm there. Like, yeah, a drug dealer is going to come to this campground and set up shop just to like, I don't know, what is it? Drive through, walk through, like it made no sense. Uh, but this notion that no, I'm a black woman and I had dreads at the time um, who just loves the ocean and needs some downtime. Like that's why I'm here. And I would see him periodically because of course then he was also there for the same week I was. Um, and he would see me like going out scuba diving with a dive group. And he was sort of like, it was always the same look of, oh, you know, like that Scooby-Doo, oh, like this does not compute, like you are an idiot. Um, so that that's kind of one of those moments that really, I don't think I'll ever forget. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that, Karen. Um, as sometimes when we get questions like this, uh, they're hard. And sometimes we don't wanna trudge up the memories and the weird and awkward times that we've had. Um, but that was, you know, Anna, that was also my question, you know, wanting to kind of know from others, like if this is something that, is this something we all go through or is this just me? And like, it is awkwardly, oddly, like nice to know that I'm not the only one experiencing these things. Um, but like also on the flip side, you know, just wanting everybody that's watching to just to know that like these things happen often to to us and people and women of color. You know, I think as I it depends on who I'm with, I should say, like Mary was saying that she goes out with her husband. You know, my husband is white like Mary's and like it's a different experience when we go out as a family as it is when I am out by myself or out with my children. Um, it's, it, it is sometimes night and day, um, which is unfortunate, but I'm um, much more sensitive to it, I guess, now that, you know, it's something where I'm like, <laughs> had to uh, deal with and have conversations with my husband with and, you know, almost like, is it just me or are you feeling this too? You know, did you get the same look that, that I just got? Um, or almost like this, yeah, like imposter syndrome that uh, Nalia was talking about in the film of just like <sighs> feeling comfortable and welcome in my boots and my shoes as I'm out on the trail. But as soon as you get that person that questions you naturally, 
you question yourself, you know, or at least that was me a couple of years ago. But now it's just like the really awkward kill them with kindness. And I'm not really quite sure if that's the way to go here or if I'm doing it right or wrong. I mean, I don't know. I'd love to hear from some of the other ladies on how you handle the situations um, when they do come. But yeah, it's it, it does happen. It's a thing. And, and hopefully it's none of the people that are watching today that are doing these things. But I mean, we just have to name them, you know, their biases, their stereotypes, their prejudice, prejudices that exist in our culture. Um, and yeah, like Karen said, you know, some, sometimes when you see a black woman, you just think like she couldn't possibly be out here reaping the benefits of nature. She must be selling drugs, which is just so silly, <laughs> silly to me, but yes. Yeah. These things do happen. And um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to, to talk about them, but they do happen for sure. <laughs> I, this past weekend, I took my family, there was eight of us, I have family visiting from Mexico, and I took them over to Portland, because I know they wanted to see some more uh, different outdoor spaces. Um, and so I was a little nervous recreating outside in, in Portland, because, you know, we were, you know, maybe eight out of like 50 people who were people of color in the, on the trails. Um, and so I was just waiting for someone to say, you know, like, you know, are you guys lost or what are you doing? Because we're wearing, you know, my brother's wearing his like white Adidas. We're all wearing jeans and, you know, we don't look the part. Um, and we actually got a really good response from people there, which was really nice. I mean, it's Portland. They, people are, tend to be nice there. Uh, but we had one woman, well, my aunt was like hugging these big trees and like taking pictures. And then one woman said, thank you for loving our trees. And that was just like such an important greeting and that kind of that that made my guard come down so I was just kind of like looking around like waiting to see whose way we were in there was a lot of runners um and then also as a guide for the team Alessa group um I'm always kind of in the front and you know when we're walking around we do kind of get like the oh like this is something different this is a new group um but I don't think I've ever had to um talk to people about a, a bad interaction that we've gotten. So that's, that's really nice. Um, I feel like sometimes I, I think, you know, I've never experienced a lot of racism, but I think maybe I just block it out or I'm kind of naive to it. I'm not sure. Um, I, I have, I have learned a lot and I'm not, I'm not a big social, I don't have a lot of social um, knowledge on, on those cues like that. I'm just now learning about a lot of this too, about social justice and equity. So I'm looking for it and I'm, and I'm learning for it. You know, and I, and I think it's important to kind of like distinguish between uh, the, the trail curiosity questions, you know, where it's like when folks are out on the trail, it's like, woohoo, we both made it up here. This is awesome. Where are you from? Like, where are you from is not a hard question to ask. Like, it's it's not, no one's going to side eye you and and redo the riot act. Like, why are you asking? Blah, blah, blah. No, because that's just that's just being on the trail. But it's it's often in the cadence of the ask, you know, um, the the tone of voice, the the way the eyes are either warm or suspicious. I mean, it's in the body language um, and not just in the words. And, um, you know, unless of course they think you're a drug dealer and they tend to not be particularly shy. Um, but, <laughs> uh, and so it's, I was talking with a, a friend of mine, um, gosh, I don't know when everything, you know, COVID pandemic time, everything blurs uh, about, well, how do I, if I see someone and I wanna like be friendly to them and like say, thank you for hugging my trees. How do I approach them? like well how would you approach any new person approach accordingly like just approach them as a fellow trail geek or kayaking geek or you know if you're scuba diving maybe don't because you know you gotta breathe but um it's just it's it's funny to me sometimes and I, and I understand that there's a lot of anxiety no one wants to make other good people don't want to make other people uncomfortable but we also do want to learn more about each other. And I, I think one of the COVID silver linings as we trans transition back into whatever constitutes opening is that we're all gonna be socially awkward. And so embrace it and laugh at yourself and laugh at the situation and get to know some new people. 
as you recreate outdoors. That's good advice. Thank you all for sharing. Um, I know that that's, that can be definitely hard to talk about. So I really appreciate that and you all being so open. Um, I had a couple other things I wanted to talk about this one, but um, just to try to kind of stay on pace to get through all the films, I'm gonna hold off and maybe we can talk more about those um, at the end if we have a little bit more time. So I'm gonna share my screen once again. And this time coming up, we have a documentary called This Land. I'd never thought of myself as a conservationist. I actually used to think that conservation was a really privileged thing and that, you know, for people from historically marginalized communities, I had to think about people first. The battle now is saying, no, I am a conservationist and redefining what that means. I didn't know anything about public lands up until about three years ago. Then I, I realized that there was essentially a showdown happening in our country with the new administration trying to roll back previously protected public lands. I'm a runner and Addie Thompson, she's a runner, and one of the ways that we explore places, one of the ways that we see the world and connect with each other and connect with environments is through running. So we hatched this plan to leave on a running exploratory road trip from Portland, Oregon, down to New Mexico. We're running 150 miles through parts of three of the national monuments that have been points of contention for the current administration. I think people think that because public lands are for the public, all people feel welcome there, and that's just not the case. I think that's what people in like conservation and, and public lands really need to understand, that they might feel welcome, and they might think that it's just a spark that needs to be ignited to care about public lands, but it is so much more than that. Brown versus the Board of Education is to me one of the most important court cases to ever happen in this country, and it is what desegregated schools. It set the precedent to say that separate but equal, which is the basis for segregation being legal, is actually invalid. And what ended up happening was a bunch of the Black State Parks lost funding and shut down. And so we lost a ton of recreational spaces for Black people, but it wasn't like overnight they were suddenly like gonna be skipping around in the state park. Like that would have been dangerous. They weren't actually welcome there. Is it 22 tomorrow? I think it's 18 tomorrow and 22 the second day is what you'd said yesterday, but I don't know. I thought, I, yeah, I, I know thought the first the day was shorter. I remember that. It's day one, so it, it, it's our like test for everything. It's our test for navigating. It's our test for figuring out like what kind of pace is going to be sustainable for that kind of thing. I'm really glad I have Jen and Addie with me. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm excited to start running. I ain't fit to be no mother. I ain't fit to be no wife. Yeah. I've been working. A national monument is a protected area of land that was protected under the Antiquities Act. But it's called a monument because it's protected in a different way than a national park would be protected. Oh, that was when we came out. Oh yeah, dude, this, now we're, we're navigating out. fucking uncharted yeah, shit. Yeah, that's the problem. Going the, it like has water, water has the it's liquid filled up. Inside. Yeah. Well, so All right guys, what are we doing? Let me get to the second thing. Yeah. So I think that's what we should this do. This might be another like surprise long day. <laughs> I don't want to talk about gender and politics and race and the outdoors on the trails in the mountains, but I mean, until we change them, we have to. People like the current administration are coming in and saying, cool, we'll just roll back these protections yeah. real quick. Just while no one's, <laughs> while no one's paying attention. No one knows about it. When I tell people like what we're out here doing, why we're doing this, they're like, what do you mean redrawing borders? Or like, what are the monuments anyway?
in Grand Circus Escalante, I was so very alone. I was running in a place I'd never been before, and I was running in a place that's not set up for running. I figured out on a map where I was gonna run, but then getting there, maybe that trail's not actually there. Maybe that road actually hasn't been used since the 80s, and maybe that river that you think you're gonna cross is dry, or maybe that river you think you're gonna cross is too high, and you can't actually cross it. But 24.8, not bad. <laughs> not what I was intending. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. My running background is on a track. Everything makes sense there. You know exactly how to run in the curve and exactly how to run in the straight, and there's not really any question about the elements. The elements are everything on the trails. You have ruts, you have inclines, you have, you know, crazy downhills while you're flailing, and then you have heat and bugs and <laughs> cacti and getting lost. So I accidentally came the back way to the Wahui Poodoos. And they're crazy. Came from down there somewhere. Look at this. Hold on. What? So freaking cool. show up to conferences related to the outdoors, when I show up to town halls related to public lands, like I am 98% of the time the only black woman in the room. I'm the youngest of three kids. My mom's white and my dad's black. And my mom's side of the family disowned her when she decided to marry my dad. And it took a few years for our family to come back around and actually claim us. <laughs> if you come from a group that has historically not been welcome, it's gonna take an effort to make you feel welcome. It just doesn't happen overnight. The national monuments are a representation of us to currently be able to say, what do we care about? These are relatively new national monuments. Right? These are not the national monuments that were established in the early 1900s. These exist as they are now because people have decided to say, this is worth protecting and preserving. People have systematically had their access limited or more importantly, emotionally and mentally had their access limited to, to places, to spaces. People have told them repeatedly, you are not to come here, or that is not something that you do. And sometimes that's from within their own community. Our mother, our earth, is not gonna survive if, if we continue to let that rhetoric resonate in young people's heads. The ability to be a public landowner and to live in a place where we've made a decision that certain lands are for everyone, whether you live really close to them or whether they're across the country, that they're there for you. For me, that's really, I mean, it's really special. I think it means like we belong to this place and, and we're its caretakers. I didn't grow up with a sense of any kind of control about what the world I lived in looked like. I think the realization of being a public landowner means that we do have a say in what the world that we occupy looks like. It gives me a huge sense of responsibility to ask more questions and learn how I can say more about what's happening in my neighborhood and my state and then my country. In a way, I guess this is what the whole journey has been about is showing that you are welcome here. I know that a lot of times we haven't seen people that look like us in certain spaces, and so I'm hoping to be one of those people. And I want all my friends to be those people too. And I want everyone to see someone that looks like them outside doing something they love and be inspired to do the same thing. 
you are welcome here. You as you, looking like you, talking like you, laughing like you, moving the way that you move are welcome here and this place is for you. That's, that's the hope. So I don't have a specific question for this one. I just wanted to kind of touch on the topic of, you know, at the beginning, Faith says um, how she didn't think of herself as a conservationist and she thought it had to be people first. Um, and, and then kind of um, tying in what it means to be welcome on, on this land and, and feel like you're a caretaker of the land. So kind of the, the, um, the idea of having access and how that could lead to if more people felt welcome and had access, um, feeling like that they were also more responsible for, you know, conservation and, and taking care of the land. So it's not a question, but just kind of, I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that topic. I can start off. Um, in college, I had that same thought. I thought I either had to do um, maybe like some kind of like social work or do some kind of like immigration lawyer and just go hard for the people or I had to be the scientist and go hard for the earth. Um, but I have the perfect job right now that lets me do both. Um, my parents are both, they both uh, immigrated here from, from Mexico. And so I had this kind of like guilt that I got this free pass. I didn't put in as much work as they did to be here. And so that's what kind of made me want to do the, the people side, which I feel like I kind of do get to do because with my work with Tima Trolesa, there are not every person that comes to on our hikes, but a good number of people who come to our, from our hikes are um, also immigrants and I'm also connecting them to, to the earth. Um, and then one of the biggest things and one of the main reasons why Tima Trolesa is, is here in Wenatchee is because of the increasing um, percentage of the diverse population in Wenatchee. I think just every every decade and every time there's a census, it probably increases by 10 or 15%. And so just the number of people that are recreating on the lands is changing. And so the people who are gonna take care of it 50 or 100 years from now, they're not all gonna be white. I think you know they need to kind of share the jobs and we need to start training these people to do these jobs. Um, I'm definitely one of the, the only uh, women of color who are who's kind of involved with the conservation side of the Wenatchee lands. Um, I guess I'll go. Um, so I mean, this really kind of hits home for me with, um, you know, caring for the land and whose land are we on and, you know, it's uh, being raised in here in Wenatchee Valley and being one of the only Native Americans here. Uh, with a family that's a product of um, residential schools and adoption. Um, my grandma was white, so I was raised uh, non-traditionally, but it's really important for me to show up on these lands because since launching Wenatchee Wear and kind of finding my purpose um, to reclaim the land for my ancestors is really important because people have asked, well, I thought the Wenatchee tribe was extinct but we're not extinct, we're still here. Even though we're not federally recognized, um, we're still here. There's a lot of, lot of members that don't live on the lands here that were forced to move to the Colville Reservation, but it's really important to continue to be present and to make those, my relatives feel welcome to come here. And that's, you know, moving forward with this Wenatchee land back and building a community center that's going to welcome indigenous people here and know that they have a center that's dedicated to them 
to be comfortable with. It's a really hard concept to kind of try to explain to a non uh, colored person about feeling comfortable with people of color. You know, you walk into a room, you're comfortable with, you're going to gravitate towards those others. At least that's what I do. And I've seen that. And we can, you know, like in the first video, they talked about being on the hill with other Black women or just other people of color. And it's that representation and having that instant connection that um, makes you put your guard down. You don't feel like you have to be there to be somebody else. Um, you can just be yourself. And so that's, that's really important. And, um, and part of this, this land, when they talked about, when you come from a group that has not been welcomed, it takes a lot of effort to feel welcomed. And that's um, something that we all need to step up and do better uh, for our uh, people of color in our community, um, because we all are still here. Um, and I just wanted to add to that. Thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, as as um, there is a lack of diversity in the valley, like there are there are people here, right? And that's super important to recognize. Even though we are are few in numbers, um, there's still so many things that can be done to make us feel more welcome and more included, and just have that overall sense of belonging. Um, and I think just speaking to uh, what you were saying, Jana, about kind of that whole, there's this term out there right now, intersectional environmentalism, you know, and I think that that's something that's really important uh, when speaking to, you know, land stewardship and caring about the land and the, and the people, right, because so much of, of what we're seeing right now um, is, is intersectional, and it intertwines, and it overlaps as far as, you know, if, if you take care of the people, then you should take care of the land. And if you take care of the land, then you're, you're taking care of the people, you know, just automatically um, that those two things shouldn't be separated. Um, those two things shouldn't have more effort than the other. You know, if you are someone that cares for the land and cares for, um, you know, our future, as far as like climate change and, and what things we should be doing to um, help in those efforts, um, you should be equally enthused about social justice and making sure that people have clean water and energy and um, that, you know, when things happen like last summer with the Colville tribes and fires break out and we need mutual aid, like if you're out there in your garden, you should be up and figuring out how to help these people because it's, it's all intersectional and we are all connected. And I think that, um, you know, the sooner we, we think of it like that, intersectional and intertwined, um, the better we really all will be. Um, and I know having, having small kids, you know, this is something that we talk about often. You know, this is something, I know Elisa mentioned going picking up trash, uh, you know, down by the river. Like, this is something we all can be doing. This is something I, it's fun and enjoyable we can do with our kids, you know, just to help them understand, one, you know, we are on Wenatchee land, and two, we need to treat it with love and respect and kindness. And how do, how do we do that? And what does that look like? You know, caring for the land and for the people all at once. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's so important. And I, I love this documentary. I love faith and what she put together with with her crew and um it's super inspirational and um really speaks to you know I was I was watching this and I was being pulled in and I was smiling really big and then I at one point I was like oh my gosh I want to lace up my shoes and go for a run I don't even know it's dark outside but it's just like that representation matters so much right to me and and if you don't ever um come to that problem where you walk into a room and you are the only one then you might not understand or feel what that looks like um because you know if you are the you know the underrepresented or the person that's always um i don't like to use the word minority but that's that's what society has has labeled us you know we are the minority we are we show up less in numbers in in a lot of rooms and communities and societies and i think that um you know until you are that person it's hard for for some people to understand the importance of representation but 
I just want to tell you that, that that documentary just made me feel like I should just go on a run right now. And that that's an, an exciting and super inspiring for sure. I was right there with you until I saw the snake on the stairs. And then I was like, Ooh, I'm good. Um, no. yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, that conservation and people first, we don't, you know, there's a cliche. There's, there's no planet B. It's cliched because it's true. And there is no away, right? We, whatever we throw away, we are actually just putting some place and hoping that nature will somehow magically make it disappear. And I, in doing so, I think we miss out on the opportunity to marry our needs as people with the needs of the land to be respected, right? So that's instead of cradle to grave, thinking in terms of products, in terms of processes, we need to think cradle to cradle. And in doing so, we create better jobs, we create cleaner water and blah, 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 blah. And uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, gosh, that landscape, I wanna go to those monuments now. Again, not where the snakes, probably like in December, but the colors in that, documentary oh my goodness so beautiful so beautiful i agree that was a gorgeous some gorgeous scenery there okay we will get to our third film this last one is called where i belong There's a lot of things that go into the process of even just getting to the river. It's intense sometimes. What rods do you want? What flies? Do you got the emergency bag? Should we bring a net? No, we don't need a net. Okay, let's get the net. Waiters, boots, waiting belt, flies, hat, sunglasses. Are we ready? <laughs> Did you get a water bottle? Drive to the river, back up the boat, put all of the stuff in the boat, put our waiters on, put our boots on, push the boat out, start the engine, and we're ready to go, finally. <laughs> That's like what goes through our head. My name is Chris Hill. I am an environmentalist and an angler and a lover of the outdoors. Growing up, I really did not like being outside at all. Oh my God, like there's too many bugs and things that could bite you. It was just, it was horrible. In middle school, my mom, she says, Chris, you're gonna go to this camp this summer and you're gonna have fun. And I was like, this is all outside. Oh my gosh, and I fell in love with it. Like I came back home and I was like, mom, I wanna do it for the rest of the summer. And then every summer after that, I went to Camp Kaleva. They really taught me not only about like getting outside and enjoying, but also conserving and conservation work. Uh-oh. Chris, I may need your help netting this guy. Oh, nice. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Oh, nice. Oh. Wow, oh! <laughs> that is a beast. Good job, bud. Oh my God, look how I know, it literally <laughs> splashed me five times. So, who is Greg? <laughs> Greg's my boyfriend. Greg Schlachter. And Chris is my girlfriend. Is there any like fun facts about Chris that we may not know about her? I'm sure you heard all of them. Like you know, her favorite uh, color is purple. She has a bunny named Francis, and she generally outfishes me. That would probably be the. But she's probably told you that too. <laughs> he's my fishing partner. You know, he's my my fishing buddy. It is fun experiencing it with Greg, but we both get competitive, and that's when it gets a little irritating. Greg, why would you do that? You're casting right in front of me. There was a fish there. <laughs> you can't cross the streams. I've been fly fishing a lot longer than she has, uh, but she's super fishy and she takes it very, very seriously. This isn't a hobby that she picked up because I like to fish. You know, I think there's a lot of times when she likes to fish more than I do. I love fishing and I love catching fish, but I also just love being out there. It's just, it's so pretty. Like you're sitting amongst these huge peaks on each side of you. It's just a place where you're like, wow, wow. And you can't stop saying wow, right? It's really hard to find those very quiet places anymore. And this is definitely one of them.
So when I went to law school, I went specifically for environmental law and human rights law. If you look at the history of the environmental movement and the conservation movement in particular, it wasn't necessarily about the people. And so I wanted to try to make that connection. Oh, uh, Jordan, this spreadsheet's really good. Chris is like a spreadsheet queen. So if she says that someone else's spreadsheet is really good, then that means it's like sick. <laughs> so I've been a lobbyist for a decade. Sometimes I don't like to say I'm a lobbyist because I always think you're working for big corporations or it's just a bad name, right? But I'm an environmental lobbyist. How, how is the, um, the California build? We're good. I mean, we've gained a lot of ground. Were you on the California call? One thing that we struggle with is not to be alarmist. But all that should be said, like, we are seeing report after report saying we either have to act very aggressively or uh, we're going to be really sorry. Growing up and doing a lot of outdoor activities, I, didn't, I never saw anybody look like me, ever. I never even saw people who looked like me in magazines. I'm just now seeing that, right? I've had multiple comments that are like, there's no black people fishing. That's a white person thing. Or are you actually, are you black? I'm like, what? Yes, like what? I think where it is challenging is when you are in spaces and you don't feel safe. That has definitely happened to me a number of times where I have legitimately not felt safe in a place that I should feel safe because it feels like home. It is um, really sad too that people think other people shouldn't be there or shouldn't have access to places. Even just being a woman, there's times when I would be out with my girlfriends fishing and guys will be like, who are you with? Like, are you with somebody else? Like, why are you here by yourself? Or they'll literally walk through the hole we're fishing at with our lines in the water. Like, just crazy stuff like that, you know? And then as a person of color, it's just compounded on top of that. What I love about fishing is it's another way to let your mind escape and not think about the things that are happening in the world or our climate crisis. Here we go. Ready to go fishing. I'm gonna catch the coho on this guy. It's a time just to stop thinking and focus on, huh, would a fish be right there? I think a fish would be right there. I feel like this is where I belong and it makes me feel alive, I guess is what I would say. That's what nature really brings to me. So I primarily use Instagram. The cool thing about this platform is that it has been a place for me to see other people who do the same thing that I do, that I would have never known before. You're like, Oh, cool! That gal of color is totally killing it on the river. I have no idea who she is. I'm gonna DM her. Come on, Greg. And it's been really amazing to see the bunch of people of color in the outdoors really putting a lot of energy into representation and equity. That, I think, is the coolest part about social media. People who are of marginalized communities have just banded together and said, we're gonna do it ourselves. We're gonna create space in the outdoors for people who look like us. And we're gonna do it together and we're gonna create this really cool, beautiful community to support each other. And that creates a sense of connection to the natural world. Okay, ready? Yep. You got it? No, not really. Dive on it. Zoom. Ow, ow, my finger. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the conservation movement, back in the day, it was all a bunch of old white people, like old white dudes. And now, 
it's transitioning into this very cool, young movement. I think that is the future of the environmental movement and the conservation movement. Yeah, there's a lot of cool shit happening right now. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening. <laughs> yes, it is go time, right, with our climate crisis. It is time to act and people are stepping up to the plate. There's a sense of advocacy here. And so I'm super optimistic. That's what we gotta be. I love her optimism at the end of that. So for this one, I'd like to ask about, um, she talked a little bit about Instagram at the end and just kind of creating space and community and how, I know a lot of us sometimes are very wary of social media these days, but um, how you can kind of use social media or other platforms to, to create space and, and talk about this. Okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, social media is so great. And being in a, with a graphic design, focusing on brand development and logos and things like that and recognition is that, you know, you utilize the free spaces that you can and, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, TikTok, Snapchat, all of them, you know, all of those are free and essentially a way to create that um, connection. That's where I found Chelsea. That's where I have found a lot of women that I love to go and hike with. Um, and I just, I really love that film. And it just, it reminds me of me and my husband and our love for the outdoors and how competitive we both are. <laughs> um, you know, they'll say, well, women can't do that. And I'll say, watch me. Um, so I'm not one to t turn down the challenge and that definitely is, um, sums us up. But yeah, I think that those are really important avenues, especially for people um, just creating connections, but also sharing your stories and creating those um, just, yeah, meaningful relationships. So um, yeah, so as I said in the beginning in my introduction, um, I have a platform on Instagram um, that has definitely grown in the last year. Um, I originally started out just, you know, wanting to find that connection, um, looking for other people of color um, that were getting out into nature like, like me and my family. Um, and you know, organically, it has grown um, into something much larger than I can handle most days. Um, but my goal was to connect with other women of color that were getting into the outdoors and using nature as therapy and a way to interact um, as a community. And I mean, I have, I have exceeded my expectations by so much. Um, not only these the women on the panel tonight, but um, some of the people in the participants that are here also. I mean, people I, I don't think I would have ever met um, because our, our trails, our, our outdoors is so big. You know, you can be on the trails all day long and sometimes not see another person. And so that is so true to to real life as well. You know, as you're climbing or hiking or skiing or snowboarding, you know, sometimes you just you miss people and you overlap and you never meet them. And so I can truly thank Instagram um, for some of the connections that I've made in the last year that I don't think that I would have made had um, had I not had my platform. Um, and I think that I think. Instagram can be a tool. Um, a lot of the times it, it can be overwhelming. It can be toxic. Um, it can be a, an echo chamber of, of really 
awful things that you you don't want to hear, you don't want to see. But I think that if you're you're following the right people, which I think is a lot of uh, my intentions have been to follow other women of color, other people that are working towards um, land preservation and conservancy and environmentalists, and you know people that have a lot of really exciting things to say. Um, I think that that has made a huge difference. But you know, I think that it's such an interesting thing because before I started my platform in 2019, I, I didn't have social media. Like I would, I just, I, I didn't, I didn't want it. I didn't like have any desire to, to have a presence or a footprint on social media. And, um, that has changed <laughs> flipped night day. And, um, I definitely encourage everyone to, to go follow she colors nature, um, on Instagram, because, you know, I talk about things that, I might not have a, a normal, comfortable conversation with you in real life, but um, a lot of the things that I put on there are things that um, are my lived experiences. And, and you might not ever hear or see or read them um, if you don't have a lot of friends of color. And I think that that's kind of the unique thing about being in the Valley is, you know, a lot of people, you know, not your fault, not not anything that is like, oh shoot, I should have done this or that differently or, or expose myself there. but you know, we just sometimes we don't often cross paths. Uh, we don't often uh, intersect in our in our communities. Um, even some of the ways that I see the valley are, are still very much segregated, um, as awful as that word is, you know, um, it's just this natural segregation between cultures. And so um, I think it's really important to, to just, yeah, diversify your books you're reading, diversify your um, audibles and your podcasts and the people that you follow on social media so you can really diversify your experience and and the things that you can connect to um so yeah i love uh actually chris we follow each other on instagram <laughs> and she's an amazing person and um i think that her, um yeah a lot of the things that she said i can resonate with um as far as like um you know, having a, a husband that is white and, and often people assuming that I'm getting outdoors because of him or I'm getting outdoors because he showed me this place or this and that. And, you know, my husband grew up in Lemworth and, and oftentimes he could care less about going hiking or snowboarding or doing anything like that. And often I'm the one dragging him out and saying, come on, we're, we're getting old. We need to get out with our kids. Come on. And so, yeah, I mean, he grew up backpacking and doing all of that before, before the enchantments were, um, what they are now, you know, he grew up doing that with his family and his parents and all of that. And so I think he experienced a, a burnout maybe, and I'm, I'm not, I'm just beginning and I'm so excited and thrilled to see and do all of the things that, that our Valley has to offer. And so, um, yeah, I know Instagram is kind of that, that weird thing. Even me, I'm like, I look at TikTok and I'm just like all these young people, right? What, ha what are they doing? Why are they dancing? What is happening? Um, but I encourage you to, if you can use it as a tool, um, there are some really amazing people out there putting some really amazing resources um, and and things together for us to really learn from. It's been pretty cool. I love your comment about the young people at TikTok. Like, I feel like, I mean, I just joined Instagram because of the pandemic and I was finding, you know, like COVID homeschooling people, you know, and and uh, I'm not particularly adept at Instagram. It's just, it's for some reason, it, I'm more of a Facebook person. Um, anyone who follows me on Facebook knows that I'm probably a bit too much of a Facebook person. Um, and, and I blog and those are kind of like my two primary outlets. Instagram is just fun for like, um, I don't know, it's been, it, it has, it's been fun in terms of like really normalizing what we do right? Normalizing how we play outdoors and making it feel really unremarkable because I'm seeing so many amazing people who are doing fabulous things, right? Um, including lots of families, you know, I'm, I'm pushing 48 and am coming back to my, my, my outdoorsy uh, foundation. And it's been cool. I mean, I, I love seeing folks younger than me who are doing great things, but I'm not going to summon any mountains. That's not my thing. I'll kind of meander around, take some selfies with marmots, you know, that sort of thing. But um, I'm also loving that there are older folks, middle-aged folks like me and older, who are just as active, just as brown, just as, as determined to claim 
um, their spaces in these places that are our public lands. So. For me, social media has been the way that I found out that I was not the only one kind of in love with nature and also a, a woman of color. Um, I remember first getting Instagram and then just being like, you know, once you follow one page, you get suggestions to follow these other ones. I mean, there's hundreds of pages out there and so many people out there that are just like us. Um, so that, that saying that people of color don't go outdoors is, is not true. There's millions out there. Yep. Um, so that's, that was like one of the best things for, for social media. And then the second best thing for social media for me has been the outreach. Um, I have to reach out to people to um, kind of get them outdoors. A lot of people just don't even know who to go to at first. One of the reasons I didn't recreate outdoors in, in high school and as a young adult was because I had no one to go with. And so that, that outreach and connecting via Facebook and Instagram with people, that allows me to take these groups outdoors and do the bilingual environmental education and all that. So Facebook has been super important. I think maybe 80% 80, 80 of our participants sign up that way through Facebook. Um, not so much Instagram, but um, yeah. So I think that's just social media. Yeah, like Chelsea said, it's it's got its, its bright sides and its dark sides. And I don't know, for me, it's been more bright sides. I do just want to add, like, Elisa, you're doing something really cool with Team Naturalesa. And I think that everybody should go follow that as well and just be encouraged by um, the projects you guys have going on. And, you know, it wasn't really until I met you and Mary and were so inspired. I think Mary's son did a, a graduate project on uh, with, a, with a sign for uh, two bears. And maybe you can speak to that a little bit, but that like sparked something in me that was just like, oh my gosh, like people should know more about the Wenatchee tribe and have signs on every trail, on every, um, you know, place that um, the Wenatchee tribe has authentic and traditional names for, you know, I think more people should know about that. And kids, I mean, my kids love the books that were put out by your uncle, Mary, that are just amazing and tell to the tradition and, and the tribe and they speak to that. And I think that more people should know about in our that in our valley um and then elisa yeah like team naturalesa is is speaking spanish and you're you're encouraging people to get out on the trails and and speaking their language which to me like the light bulb went on like all of these signs are, are in english but like we have a huge latino population like what there's a problem here you know and so just really having my my light bulbs come on as I'm meeting more people and connecting on social media and um, just loving the content that you both are putting out um, and being really encouraged um, to kind of step outside of my bubble because you know I too have blind spots as a black woman I can speak to those lived experiences but I cannot speak to the indigenous or the um, lived experiences of a Latina woman you know and so I think that just really thinking about that and how we can be inclusive to all people will take us kind of stepping outside of our own shoes and putting ourselves in the shoes of others. And I think that that's, that's really cool. Social media checks me every day and makes, makes sure that I'm uh, really make, making sure that I'm doing, doing better for, for all people, which is inspiring. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I love to share the uh, information, you know, about our designs. Um, each of our designs start out hand sketched uh, from me um, or my husband. And then we create the house, uh, the artwork in house, and we produce the garments in house. We just started printing all of our own garments in house. And we're just a two person team with a, a very part time person that comes in and helps print. But um, yeah, everything is created from the heart and is to represent uh, my ancestors and just the land that we are on. Um, and my son created his uh, Eagle Scout project last year. So that's the highest rank of Boy Scouts. So he officially completed. It's very rare for uh, Native Americans to reach that status. Um, so, you know, we, uh, a lot of people from uh, the Caldwell Reservation had reached out and said, you know, my husband really tried to accomplish that and he's so proud of your son for doing that because there's not very many Native Americans that are able to accomplish that. So it's, um, 
it's I'm really proud of him and what he's done. And so his sign is actually on the east side of the Apple Capitol Loop Trail. Um, it is between the George Sulla Bridge and the Walking Bridge. And so it is a picture of, it's a shape cut sign of the two bears tail that um, is the design, which is really cool that he chose to do that. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to walk over there. And so I'm actually working with other organizations to create new signage in Leavenworth, uh, potentially a mural. And then with the um, land back, we are moving forward with forming a nonprofit to go ahead and handle uh, growing this venture as far as obtaining land back and creating a community that's uh, welcoming to indigenous people. So yeah, there's, you know, like Chelsea said, it can be very overwhelming, um, you know, being a small business owner and, and having all those things to do, it can be so overwhelming. Sometimes it's nice to just shut it off. <laughs> but yeah, it's always nice to share the content and the feedback and knowing that people are listening and learning and teaching their families. Um, that's really important. Thank you. I know I've learned a lot from several of you and, and what you've shared. And I know a lot of our participants have as well. So we really appreciate um, the knowledge that you've shared. So we've got a few more minutes here. I'm going to open it up. If anyone has any questions, um, you can type it in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Um, and also I'm going to open up to the, the panelists while we're getting those um, questions. And if you have anything else from the films or anything else that you wanted to share. I, I want to go back to the expedition reclamation film. Um, I had somebody, I don't remember what organization they were from, but they were asking me if I knew of any um, outdoor films that had um, like Latino, like outdoors persons that was in Spanish. And I found nothing, 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 nothing out there. Um, so that was, it was shocking to me. I'm like, how is there not one film, not even a YouTube video? that was in Spanish. It only had subtitles. Even like our planet wasn't in Spanish. Like it's so crazy. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this film that's gonna be local. Um, what, I mean, we're not sure if it's gonna be available in other languages yet, um, hopefully, but it's, yeah, I'm just so excited for that film. I see someone raising their hand, Larry. Yeah, hi. Um, this is really neat to hear about. And uh, I just want to make sure you all know, uh, I know there's two of us, maybe more. I didn't go through everybody. Maybe Liz Davidson is on here too, I'm not sure. Um, but Jackson and I are on from the Rowan Paddle Club, Wenatchee Rowan Paddle Club. And I want you to all to know that um, uh, we really would love to have you um, join our activities there. Uh, and we um, do one-on-one -on -one, uh, training for people to get out on the river in either kayaks, or my specialty is the, the rowing shells, uh, individual rowing shells, or canoes, stand-up paddle boards, uh, or um, the surf skis, things of that nature. And we would just really um, be honored to have um, um, people of color, um, women of color, uh, men of color uh, participating with us. We want to cordially invite you all to, to do that. We have a, a website, which is wenatchirowpaddle.org uh, where you can get um, information and names and phone numbers and so forth to uh, to uh, inquire about participating. Also, when uh, when COVID kind of is more in the background, we'd love to have groups say uh, be able to come out in our big canoes and be able to go as a group. Um, Team Naturaleza and perhaps uh, other groups, um, indigenous people, um, we have um, 29 foot canoes 
that are really fun to go uh, on the river and go through the Haran natural area, get out on the sandy shores. It, it's a great experience. And uh, we do that with um, student groups, uh, certainly not during this time, but we hope to get back doing it with our youth on Columbia, but we wanna make sure that people know about that. Okay, I just wanna say- Thank you. Like, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, so much of the problem, um, you know, on our end, it's like there's barriers to access to getting outdoors. Um, like I don't have a canoe and, you know, most people I know don't own a paddleboard or anything like that. So um, the invitation is huge, um, you know, and, and making that connection and putting names to faces. Um, I know Larry, right? And then is this your wife? Yes, this Penny. Penny. Yeah. Penny. Hi, Penny. Um, well, I've met yeah, a but couple just, people, but yeah, oh, so important. Larry and Penny. I'm gonna write that down because I yeah. I love well, I love the water now. I didn't always love the water. Um, and so much of you know my background, my parents, um, they both didn't know how to swim. Uh, they both are not comfortable in the water. We never owned a boat growing up, you know, all kind of all of those things that that story. And so my experience getting in the water or on a boat or on a paddleboard um, was with other friends. Um, and like now my husband and his family and all of that. And so I'm getting more and more comfortable with it. But I do know, um, and maybe Elisa, you could speak to this. Uh, my brother-in-law, um, you know, his family is from Mexico. And like, we, we go on the boat. He is like, I will not go on that boat. And like, it's been a struggle, you know, his daughter gets on the boat and we're all just trying to encourage him. But like, he truly has like that deeply embedded fear of water um, and just ultimately not feeling safe out there. So I'm wondering if there's some, you know, maybe another connection in the Valley where we can almost like hook people up with like an adult swim lessons or, or so, you know, something like that. I don't know if the YMCA around here or, or something like that, but just really kind of thinking out of the box to, you know, make that invitation, but then to also make people feel welcome and, and comfortable in a space such as rowing and paddling in, on the Columbia. I don't know, <laughs> but I, right. I, I, and I just want you to know that you don't have to own any boat to participate with us. The club owns a whole bunch of boats of these different types. And um, it's really uh, super inexpensive to join our club. Uh, that's hopefully is not a barrier. In fact, we even have scholarships available. So um, if it is, and then um, uh, you have access to all these boats yeah. as well as the training. So we're trying to reach out to people. I love yeah, it. That's great. Thank you so much. And Chelsea, I'll ask my son about the adult swim lessons. Um, he is a lifeguard at the YMCA. And then um, he actually taught us how to use paddle boards this summer, my first time. So he's a very thorough teacher. So I'll ask him. I love that. Very nice. <laughs> I think being here, like as a local, I think growing up, I heard more horror stories of the Columbia River rather than like success stories. Like, I think like my family knew more people who almost drowned in the river than people who um, than, that recreated in the river. It's, you know, that's, I mean, there's, so there's fear, there's a lack of knowledge. Um, but now that I know how to recreate on the river, there's, there's things that you can do when you do get into those scary situations. So I think it's just the lack of knowledge and it's not just, it's not the water, it's knowing how to work with it instead of against it. Okay, do we have any more questions for our panelists or any other things? Um, I'll let panelists, if you have any uh, kind of shout outs you'd like to, I think you've all kind of mentioned your social media pages and projects, but um, if there's anything else you'd like to share, please do. The only other thing that I want to uh, share is um, the trailer that we watched from the very beginning, um, just really reiterating the fact that that is like, that's a hometown 
project, you know, like we have several characters, um, a part of this overall film project. It's going to be a short film documentary, um, and we're hoping to have it all done and wrapped up and have something to show everyone um, this coming summer, probably late summer. Um, but, you know, six out of the 12 characters are well four of us are on this call right now you know or five actually um and so yeah i mean it's a it's a very local very hometown um homegrown grassroots film and we are super excited to share it with you all um and i think at one point the um the campaign for our crowdfunding is going on right now as we are just trying to make sure that everyone gets paid and everyone gets seen and heard in this project. And so um, I think we entered it a little while ago, but it's just a Seed and Spark platform and we are raising money right now. And so um, I just want all of you guys to know that and to um, make sure you go and watch the trailer in the quiet and the good the good sounds in your in the comfort of your home so that you can really just see um one of the filmmakers on the project um i believe born and raised here um very local erin joy nash um and i'm just i'm so excited to be collaborating with her on this project just to make sure that the people that um we want to be seen in outdoor film are being seen and heard in outdoor film. Um, I know I've gone to Leavenworth Film Festivals over the last couple of years and just kind of always felt with that or left feeling, um, you know, vastly uninspired, I guess, because a lot of the people were like free soloing and doing really extreme and really rad things, which, you know, most of us don't do any of that, right? We're just, you know, we're rowing and paddling and, and enjoying the water and, and going up and camping up the icicle and um, hitting up two bears and going hiking on a beautiful day. So, you know, we want to represent those people too, you know, all ages, all colors, all people. And so that's really important to us. I mean, that it's important to you guys as well. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, looks like Saint, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. I'm also a board member with Wenatchee Row and Paddle Club. And I kind of wanted to go back to when we were giving the land and water recognition um, and kind of have a follow-up question in regards to that. Our club um, is presenting an EDI statement, so equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I wanted to know the importance and the impact you think that that has. And if somebody asked, why are you, what's the reason for writing this statement or is it important? I wanted to hear your take on how impactful those statements are or if there's better ways or that that statement be accompanied by also a strategic imperative to make change. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's, you know, with land acknowledgements, I've had a lot of organizations and people reach out to me to ask me that specific question and you know, they want to do it properly and learn and uh, grow from this. And what I tell them is that, you know, don't do a land acknowledgement just to um, simply acknowledge, like we need to pair that with a meaningful purpose. Um, and that's to continue to educate and share those important histories that we aren't taught in school. You know, I was born and raised here in Wenatchee and I didn't really learn about my tribe here. Um, so in pairing that with a meaningful relationship with the tribe, regardless of whose land you're on, you know, so do your research. Um, I know it's hard to find some things, but there are resources, the tribe's websites, um, there's local books. My uncle Randy does a lot of things with the museums and really pairing that. And that's where a lot of corporations and businesses have failed is that they're appropriating and creating unethical business practices. So um, by simply just saying, I'm honoring you by using this name and that's truly not an honor or um, doing, doing any good. So that's really the first step is recognizing that you're trying to create a meaningful land recognition. And when people ask you, you can tell them that uh, you know, you're amplifying Native American voices and you're letting um, our histories be told. And I do actually have a blog piece on Wenatchee Ware's website that shares information about how to recognize properly. And another important key is to talk about Native Americans in the present and future. 
um, we're not gone, that we're not just in the past, that we're still here. So I hope that that answers your question. Yes, thank you, that was very insightful. You know, um, one of my favorite posts from Mary recently on Facebook was a land acknowledgement she did. She's standing in the middle of the main street in Leavenworth on the east, well, south end of town looking north towards Icicle Ridge. She's got her hands on her hips. You're seeing her from the back and you can just imagine what she's thinking of this Bavarian village. <laughs> really, really? This is what you did? Um, so check her out on Facebook. That that picture is it's iconic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely echo that. I've I've learned a lot from Mary um, in the last year, and I think that um, yeah, I, I we all have a place where we can be doing better, right? And um, I think when I first started out understanding some of these things, you know, it was like, okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not messing up, you know, kind of walking on eggshells a little bit, not understanding, you know, what a real true land acknowledgement might look like. Um, and just wanting to, you know, check the box, you know, okay, so I'm, I'm here, I'm there. And I checked the box. I, I did that, but um, you know, so much of, of this work is, is hard work, right? Like you're really just like, I want to do better, but like, why, like, why do you want to do better? You know? And like, for me, it's like, I have, I have Mary, I have a, 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 cur a per personal connection where it's like, oh my gosh, like I want to do better for Mary and I want to do better for my kids so that they understand. And I want to make sure that people understand that it is, it is the now, right. It's not past tense um, because so much of, of our society um, and the systems just make us think and believe um, that it was, past tense. Um, for example, Martin Luther King just passed and my kid came home with a black and white photo of, of the situation. And I just, you know, I'm like this, this was created in black and white to make us think that this was a really, really long time ago and that we should think of this as, as like past problems. You know, this is a, a past situation that happened a really long time ago and things are better now. Um, which is not always the case, you know, and, and same with the Wenatchee tribe. I think it's important that uh, we know that and Mary's here and she's doing a lot of really cool things behind the scenes with other native and indigenous people. Um, and so if we can just make sure that we're doing our best to follow what she's got going on and, um, you know, don't be taxing, I guess. Don't, don't, don't come at her with, you know, all of these things in her in emails and saying, Hey, can you do this for us? Or, Hey, can you do that? Um, you know, I think we've all learned a lot here tonight. And so I think if we, you know, take, take what we've learned and, and go forward and, and just trying to do better, but understanding it's a heart thing, an empathy thing, right? Compassion um, for other people that don't look, walk, or have the same lived experiences as we do. I think that's important. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Thank you all um, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much to the panelists. Um, I want to thank Wenatchee Outdoors again, our co-sponsor. Um, be sure to visit WenatcheeOutdoors.org. They have a lot of great information on there, a calendar that shows you all sorts of events coming up. Um, and Sarah has a note in the chat that you're, uh, anyone is welcome to reach out to her at Sarah at Wenatchee outdoors.org. So please do that. Um, if you enjoyed this and don't already follow Sustainable Wenatchee, uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter. I send just one a month and that will let you know of all the, the events we have. So you can do that at sustainablewenatchee.org. Um, and in our next newsletter, I'll be sure to include links to the films that we watched tonight. I know I didn't do much of an introduction for each of them, kind of um, just in uh, trying to keep it short. So uh, I want to totally give credit to the wonderful filmmakers. And so I'll include those links in my next newsletter that will go out next week. Um, and also wanted to just put the plug that if you enjoyed this, we're a nonprofit supported by memberships. And so you can become a member at sustainablewenatchee.org for just $35 a year, have to say it. Um, so I'm Karen had the great idea to 
rewatch that um, trailer again from the beginning with my sound appropriately connected. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that and we can all try to watch it again or uh, say goodnight. So let me share my screen here. They ask, what are you, trying to make sense of our hues, as our chocolate brown fingers braid raven black hair in salute to the spirits of our grandmothers. They ask, why are you here? As we step into the radiance of the woods, the waterfalls, waves, and peace. In play, in pilgrimage, over challenge we thrive. Our healing men's roots of the earth beyond their expectations, beyond their line of sight, onward to our own horizons. It's here, in nature, we claim our belonging. So great. Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Check the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Thanks for great. playing that again. Jenna. Yeah, no it. problem. Sorry, I messed it up the first time. <laughs> That's okay. That works. I like that. Okay, I hope everyone has a great night. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, Karen, Mary, Elisa. Bye. <laughs> Good night, yes. <laughs> Talk to you soon, Mom. <laughs>